Now, if you have been camping, there's a good chance you've spent some time in the rain. If you've been camping like twice, then you've spent some time in the rain. Who here has camped and gotten a little bit wet? I know the feeling, all right? Because man, when it decides to rain and you know that there's no such thing as a waterproof tent, regardless of what they say, every tent leaks. And I remember growing up when I was got to be a little older teenager, 16, 17, a few friends of mine, we would, there was a group of us, we'd go out camping, and what we did was we got a little bit smart and we put our, set our tents up in a little bit of a circle close to a big tree, and then we got a tarp. It was like 20 feet wide by 40 feet long, and we got the tarp up as high as we could and then stretched it down on an angle over our tents so we would have a few barriers because it's no fun getting wet. Well, I re- you know, a few years ago, I decided I want my family to experience some of the experiences that I had growing up. So I took them camping. So we found a lake, we had a boat, and I was like, you know what, we're gonna go up and we're gonna go to this campsite, gonna go camping. And we left and we, it was in Wisconsin, and we got a few, about an hour outside of where we were gonna be camping, and sure enough, it starts to rain. And I mean, it's bad enough that it rains when you're there, but setting up in the rain, not fun. So, and I knew this, and I'm, we're getting, I'm like, Okay, and I could see the look on my family's face. So I said to my wife, I said to Susie, all right, if it's still raining when we get there, we'll just get a hotel room and we'll, that, we'll, it's no fun setting up in the rain. Well, we get there and it kind of the rain lightened up and I decided, you know what, let's just set up. Well, that was a mistake because I think Susie was praying that it would still be raining when we got to the campsite because she had in her mind, because I told her that we were going to go to a hotel. So nonetheless, um, I spent the, the night setting up in the rain, and we were cold, and we were wet and damp, but the next day, the sun came out, and we, we had a great time. But there's just something about being cold and wet. It's just not fun. Well, we've been in a series called Mountainside chats and we've been looking at uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Let's go ahead and take a look at this video. Work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone who heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. I cannot wait for next weekend. I want to make sure that everyone is ready for our Believe services next weekend because I believe that we're gonna see the hand of God move and we want you to be inviting friends, bringing friends, friends that need healing, friends that are saved, friends that are unsaved. I believe it's going to be a powerful weekend that we are going to see the hand of God move, and I want you to get in your word this week and build your faith, all right, because I want to walk into this place fully expecting and knowing that the hand of God is going to move, and we are going to see people healed. Amen, church? Amen. Well, in that video that we just saw, is a video of Jesus and his Sermon on the Mount, um, it was clear that Jesus was talking about two kinds of people. I don't know if you caught it, but, but Jesus, as he was teaching, he was teaching about two different kinds of people. People who build their house on the sand and people who build their house on the rock. And Jesus, he was clear. He makes a statement, and really his whole lesson is predicated on this statement. 
he says, everyone who hears these words of mine, he said, everyone that hears these words of mine, you have two options. There's two different options that are going to happen when you hear these words of mine. One, that does not put them into practice, or two, that does put them into practice. And based upon which one that you choose is the foundation of which you're building your life on. Are you building your life on the sand? Are you building your life on the rock based upon how you respond to Jesus' words? How are you responding to the word of God? How are you responding to messages that you hear? How are you responding to God? Are you building your life on rock? Are you building your life on sand? So we're going to be taking a look today at three differences between rock and sand. There's probably a lot more, but we're going to look at three differences. And the first difference is that, number one, that sand forms to its environment. Sand forms to its environment where rocks just don't move. All right, the sand, and it doesn't matter what an environment that it's in, it forms to that environment. In this one, we have a nice aquarium here, and it's formed to this size of this aquarium. But if I take a different size, a different shape container, and, and I fill it up, guess what? The sand, it formed to this container now. What, you know what, if I get another container, this one's a little round, and I take it and I scoop it up. Well, the sand forms now to this container. The sand, it will, whatever its environment, it just simply forms to that environment. You know, our world, our culture, wants us as believers to be a little more like sand. A little more like sand that we would just form to whatever our culture and our world says. Mold and shift to whatever they deem as moral, to whatever they deem as true. See, the, the, the morals and, the, and what is true in our culture and world is shifting almost on a daily basis. The thing is, is there's no absolute shape of sand. Did you notice that? There's no absolute shape to it. It just molds and shapes and it shifts to, to whatever it is. And there's no absolute. It just takes the shape of its environment and its surroundings. Well, Paul says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I looked up to see what is the definition of conform. Well, the conform means to give the same shape, to be similar or identical, to be obedient or compliant. That is what conform, be obedient, be compliant, um, shape to, be similar. That is what conform says. And, and Paul says, no, no, don't conform to the patterns of this world. But I fear that Christians are taking the shape simply of our surroundings and conforming to this world. So you have to ask yourself, as morals shift and change, and here's a popular word that I've noticed politicians like to use, evolve. Well, if I'm evolving, then there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I'm just moving with culture and what I thought and believed 30 years ago. I've just evolved because the culture has evolved. So therefore, it's okay if I shift and change. But ask yourself, are you shifting and changing what you believe with culture? What you believe right now about sin, heaven, and hell, different than it was 10 years ago, just simply because culture is changing? Do we align with culture, or do we align with the word of God? Is what you believe shaped by a worldview, culture, news, media, or is it shaped by a biblical view? And what God says is truth, and what God says is moral. See, 
How do you manage your time? How do you manage your money? Does it look more like the world or does it look more like the disciples who turn this world upside down for the cause of Christ? See, the word of God is absolute truth. And people have a hard time with this. If you've noticed, people have a really hard time with absolutes. And the word of God is absolute truth. And if culture and the world that we live in admits that it's absolute truth, well, then all of a sudden there's a standard of which they have to live by. And they don't want to. They want to live by their own standard. They want to live by what they say is moral, what they say is true, because they just want to change it whenever culture changes. But all of a sudden, if you have an absolute, an absolute truth, an absolute standard, well, then it changes for them. Because... They bought into this idea that it's my life. It's my life. I can live how I want. I can do what I want. And you know what? It's just, you know, what's good for you is good for you. But you know what? I'm just going to live my life how I please. Well, Jesus teaches something much different. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, Jesus says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me We'll find it. So Jesus, if you've noticed, typically teaches the opposite of what our world says. Our world says, yeah, it's my life. I can live how I want. Jesus says, actually, no. If you want to save your life, you're going to lose it for my sake. Sand shifts and it changes and fits to its environment. Rock, not so much. Rock, let's see here. Um... Not going to fit. This rock, if I dropped it, it'd probably crush this glass jar. Because it's not shifting. It's not going to change. It's not going to move. It is absolute. Jesus said, build your life on the rock, the absolute, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? The second difference I want to look at between sand and rock is the impact of weather. The impact that weather has on sand and on rock. So, Jesus' illustration that he talked about in, in that scripture, in that, in that portion of scripture was, he said, you know what, hey, when the streams rise and the rain falls, so here I got some water, and what's gonna happen when I pour water on the sand. Guess what? The whole landscape of the sand just shifted. It just changed based upon a little bit of water that I poured in it. It doesn't look anything like it did before. It moved, it shifted, and where the water concentrated the most, it actually created just a little crevice and, and just a little kind of almost like a little hole. You can just see it where the water has gathered right here and, you know, the sand pushed up against the sides. The impact that just a little bit of water had on the sand changed its entire shape. Verse 27, it says, The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When you build something on something that can be so easily manipulated that it can shift and move and change, there's no stability. There's no stability in sand so when storms come, Jesus said, it's going to fall with a crash. The outside elements are going to impact the foundation. When the storms of this life come, what is your life built on? What are you building your life on? Jesus said, if you obey my word, you do as I say, you do what I teach you, it's like building on the rock. But if you hear the word and you choose not to obey, you're building your life on the sand. What is your life being built on right now? Are you building your life on sand? 
Be like, okay, well, what does that mean? What does that look, what is sand, what, do you, what, what exactly? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of some real life ideas of what that could be. Jesus said, right, he said, everyone hears the word of mine and does it. So he hears the word of mine and does not put it into practice. Is like the one building their life on sand. So you hear the word of God, but you don't put it into practice. So real life example. Last week I talked about how our culture that Paul says we need to run from sexual immorality. Which meaning, okay, hey, having sex outside of marriage, that is, goes against God's word. I talked about it last week. So, did anybody have sex outside of marriage this past week? That would be building your life on sand. You heard the word of God that I preached last week, and then you leave this place and you choose to ignore the word of God. That is building your life on the sand. James says, you know what, faith without works is dead. So, that means that we ought to have some works in our life. We hear the word of God, okay, faith without works is dead, I hear it, now I'm responsible to live that out. Am I going to ignore the word of God, or am I going to walk in the word of God? So let me ask you, do you serve anywhere? Do you feed the hungry? Do you talk to your kids about Jesus? Do you put others first? Do you love your neighbor? What kind of attitude do you have in your relationships? Did that work? These are the kind of works that we're talking about. Do you have these in your life? You've heard the word of God, but what are you doing with it? Jesus said, go and make disciples. We've heard the word of God. Now are we ignoring it or are we listening to it? Are you sharing your faith? Hebrews, Hebrews says, the writer of Hebrews says, you know what, we are not to forsake the assembly of believers. What we're doing right now. You know, the, the statistics have shown that Christians have the, the, the decline of Christians going to church. And I'm not just talking about in person. I think it was around August, September, this past, in 2020, August, September 2020, that it had been like six months since 35% of Christians had attended or even watched a service online. So I'm not talking just about coming in here. I'm talking, there's 35% of Christians haven't even watched a service up until August of 2020. But Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembly of the believers. So are we listening to the word of God and obeying, or are we just deciding what we want to listen to and what we want to obey? Can I be brutally honest with you? I'm going to, regardless of what your answer is. I've been in full-time ministry for 16 years. In those 16 years, I've worked in five churches in five different states in two different countries, spanning from Canada all the way down to South Texas and San Antonio. So I've, I've lived and worked in a lot of different places. And every church, I've heard people talk about, man, we want revival. Man, we want a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. They talk about how we want those things until they see what it takes. What do you mean you want me to drive a van to go pick people up? Well, I thought you wanted revival, and if you haven't heard that term, it's just simply saying, you know what, we want a whole bunch of people to get saved and the power of God to move, but you want me to go and drive a bus? Mm. Oh, we want revival, we want a powerful move of the Spirit, but I'm not going door to door. Mm -mm. Oh, you want me to give food away? I'm sorry, I am booked that day. So don't talk to me about revival and a mighty outpouring of the Spirit until our kids' ministry is fully staffed with volunteers. Until we have greeters that we can be fully staffed, youth leaders, people willing to work in the nursery because we need people watching kids so the parents can come in here, hear the word of God and make a commitment to Christ. Believe me, I want revival. I want a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But guess what? Faith without works is dead. And I think sometimes what Christians mean when they say we want a revival is they, they think that just the Holy Spirit's just gonna bring everybody in. You don't see that anywhere throughout history. The Holy Spirit moves, but it's through us. People willing to go out and work. 
willing to go out and serve, willing to go out and pray, willing to go out and feed people, willing to go out and pick people up and bring them to church, willing to go and share their faith in their workplaces, in their schools, and in their neighborhoods, that's what revival is. That's what a mighty outpouring of God's spirit looks like. Amen? We won't survive on sand because the storms of this life are gonna come and they are going to beat against your life. This is gonna test the foundation of which you've built. You need to build your life on this rock. So, we all know what happens, right? When we pour water on the rock. We saw what happened when we poured water in the sand and we know what happens when we pour water in the rock, right? We know it just bounces off of it. We know nothing happened, right? But as that scripture said, hey, you know what? The storms of this life are gonna come. All right, the, the winds are going to beat against you. The, 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 the streams are going to rise. The only thing that happened to the rock was it got wet. You're going to get wet in this life, okay? You're, you're, you're going to get a little bit dirty. You're going to get a little bit wet. But Jesus said the foundation is going to stand. You want to stay standing today, church? Build your life on the rock. And you will stand strong. The storms are going to come, yes. The waves are going to rise, yes but we will remain standing when we are built in G- on Jesus Christ. That is how we need to build our life. Verse 25, the rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet you did not fall. Why? Because built a foundation on the rock. Building your foundation on the word of God doesn't mean the absence of storms but it means stability and strength during the storm. Storms are coming, but are we ready? Are we built on the rock? Number three, the third difference between sand and rock is substance. All right, substance. Have you noticed what sand, what happens when you pick up sand? Maybe you've been to the beach, right? And you pick up the sand, okay? And it just, it just falls through your hands. It just like, and it's like there's, I'm almost trying to, you can't even find a grain of sand that's like almost microscopic. It's so thin. There's just, there's nothing to the sand. It's like it just falls through my hands. There's nothing to it. See, whatever, but rock, whatever you attach to rock doesn't move. I grew up in a little town in northern Ontario called Perry Sound. My dad was a contractor. He built custom homes, and I worked with him since I was a kid, seven, eight, nine years old. And how we put foundations in in Perry Sound was much different because we had what we call the Canadian Shield. And the Canadian Shield is like a huge rock that spans um, provinces. Like, I mean, the thing, it's massive. Maybe, maybe you learned about it in school, but it's, it's, it's rock that's literally part of the earth. Go ahead and throw that first picture up. This is a picture of a house um, somewhere near where I grew up. You can see the whole rock coming out. Like, you're not moving that rock, okay? And, and so when you build a foundation on this kind of rock, now you could blast the rock, it's the only way to move it, to get a flat surface, but why would you blast something so stur- sturdy? Right, why, A, the cost is you know, astronomical, but why would you blast out something that, that is so strong? So what we do is go to the next picture, is we would build forms and footings around the rock. Then we would drill holes into the rock just, and then put a rebar into it to attach it from the rock to the foundation. And, and so there are those two styrofoam, you can see the rebar coming up, it's right into the rock and we pour cement right into that little form and it attaches to that rock. And let me tell you, that house is going nowhere. That foundation is not moving. I don't care what kind of storm comes through there. Tornado can come through there. And I might take the roof off, might even take the, you know, the house off, but what will be left is that foundation because it is so strong. It is secure to the rock. Whatever you secure to that rock, it is not moving. Psalms in 62, uh, 2 says, truly he is my rock and my salvation. 
He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Worship team, you can come on back. Man, he is my rock and my salvation. Is he your fortress today? Because if he is, you will not be shaken. You will not be shaken. Oh, the winds are gonna blow. The storms are gonna come. What are you attaching your life to today? When you hear the word of God, what are you attaching your life to? And Jesus said it like this, you either obey or you don't. That those are the only two options you, that you have. You either obey the word of God after you hear it or you don't. And when you obey the word of God, he says you're building your life on the rock. But if you choose to disobey, you're building it on the sand. What are you building your life on today? And that all comes in how you respond to God's word. When you read scripture during your personal devotion time, how do you respond? When you have your personal prayer life and, and you feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you, you're, you're reading your personal devotion time and, and you feel God speaking to you and, you and you learn something like, man, how do you respond? That will dictate what your life is built upon, Jesus said. Are you building on something that will wash away when the storms of life come? Are you building your life on something that is secure, that will never move, that will never shake, the solid rock of God's word? That is what we are called to live our life on. I want you to go ahead and stand to your feet today. We're gonna sing a song called Stand. And it's really fitting because I believe that, that it's time that the people of God really take a stand and, and not so much in here because here's the thing. In this room here is gonna be the easiest time to stand for the cause of Christ. It's the easiest time to worship and raise your hands. Okay, the Bible says, you know, there's plenty of scripture that says in Psalms and throughout God's word that we are to raise our hands, kneel down. Whatever that posture looks like in here, it's the easiest time. But what I believe God is looking for is he's looking for churches. He's looking for people that will live and stand out there in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces, in your schools, some of you in your families. Stand. Take a stand for the cause of Christ. I believe that God's spirit wants to move in a powerful way. And I believe the only thing standing in the way is us. It's us. We are the only thing standing in the way of God's mighty outpouring of his spirit. And just wanting God's spirit is not enough. I'm sorry, it's, it's not. You don't see it in scripture. We don't see it in history. Faith without works is dead. Jesus is looking Another place he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. God's looking for workers. He's looking for people that will live out their faith, that will say, yes, I believe it wholeheartedly, but you know what, I'm gonna go live it out in my workplace. I'm gonna go live this out in my neighborhood. I'm gonna go live this out in my school. I I I'm gonna share my faith, what Christ has done with me. I'm gonna bring somebody next weekend that needs to be healed. We are gonna see God move in a supernatural, powerful way. I don't believe it's gonna stop next weekend either, but it's gonna take us taking some steps of faith and living out this amazing book. And when we do, it'll change your life. And you know what? It'll change our community too. So let's go ahead and sing this together.